So hello, Black, Mo it's Black Mountain Talks with you and this is Lena and uh, today I'm going to speak to Larry Johnson who is a uh, veteran of CIA and we're going to discuss some questions about uh, uh, American politics and about European politics too if possible. And my first question would be uh, without going too much into politics, what do you think about uh, U.S. election system and uh, how it's going to be and maybe there are some changes uh, will be made in this system and uh, how do you see elections in general? Sure. Well, the system's a mess. It's a, it's a complete mess um, in disarray. The uh, Democrats and much of the Republican establishment are doing everything in their power to try to keep Donald Trump from being able to run again. And Donald Trump is running again. And Donald Trump is still wildly popular. So uh, then on top of that, you have Joe Biden, who with each passing day, he visibly uh, becomes uh, more disoriented, more out of touch with reality. He's, he's really in the grips of a, a dementia and there's no way to to fix that. It's it's an inevitable decline. Uh, we keep wondering how he's able to survive with each passing day. We wonder what medications are pumping into him. And then there are going to be at least uh, three uh, third party movements pop, pop up. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And then the, there's a group called No Labels. Uh, they're basically they're an anti-Trump group. So they're only going to run a candidate if Trump becomes a candidate, which is sort of an odd decision because I think that uh, they anticipate that they're going to pull votes from Trump, but I think it'll be just the opposite effect. They'll pull votes that would normally go to Joe Biden or to another candidate. And then uh, you always also have the libertarians and the greens. So it's, it's a very chaotic uh, picture. And uh, one thing that is clear there's growing discontent and anger over the failure of the United States to contain immigrants at the southern border. The, the, this illegal, this flood of illegal immigrants is really becoming an issue with an estimated 12 million already uh, in the country uh, during the last three years. Um, that's impressive number, to be honest. And uh, I was speaking to one of my friends, his wife is in uh, organizing elections, I don't know what her role is in it, and he said that his wife been doing that for more than 30 years and she feels really depressed about candidates and about what is going to happen. And uh, why I'm asking, because you know, all the world like uh, looks up to the US and uh, people want to know how, how it's going to be there, so uh, everyone like must plan accordingly, I think. Well, the United States has turned into a banana republic, candidly. It is, uh, its election system is not secure. Uh, it is, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very certain of the fact that the last election was stolen from Donald Trump. It was stolen using mailed-in ballots that were pre-printed and, and stuffed. They just literally stuffed them into the ballot box. They figured out how many votes they needed and then totaled the, total them up, inserted them into the process. So, you know, the United States has a its system is just totally corrupt and people have lost confidence in it. <clears throat> yeah, that's really sad because uh, when we had like two polls, like the USSR and the, U and the US, the world was more clear. Maybe it was Cold War then, but there were more order. Right. Now it looks like everything is just falling apart and uh, yeah. I think worst is yet to come, but I hope it will yeah, not. No. Yeah, no, I'm afraid you're right. No. <laughs> I'm also afraid that I'm right. So, but yeah, let's let's keep positive. It's the beginning of the year. Maybe something good will happen. And uh, there is also one question about well, it also connected maybe with the internal mess in the U.S. about Lloyd Austin. Yeah. Uh, media reported that uh, as if he was absent from from his office and it w was known by the administration only several days after. Right. How how something like that can can, can even be possible? Well, it should the, the, number one it shouldn't happen. Uh, Lloyd Austin has a deputy. There's a deputy secretary of defense. If he's incapacitated in any um, in any way, 
he should immediately, that should be reported, and the number two person should take over. The, the failure to report this to the White House, to the Biden administration, just shows you how weak Joe Biden is, how irrelevant he is. That, you know, these, these different government uh, agencies, whether it's Department of Defense or Homeland Security, really feel that they can do whatever they want to do on their own without any kind of oversight or input from the White House. And so I, the, it's really dangerous on top of that because the Secretary of Defense in his capacity is the, the represents really the center of civilian control over the military and over nuclear weapons. And he goes into the hospital and then they hide him away in the intensive care unit at Walter Reed Hospital there in Bethesda. It's just, it's, a, it's an unbelievable story. I think, I don't think this thing is done percolating. This is going to really capture the attention of Washington this week. Yeah, it captured uh, already. I'm look, uh, just uh, <clears throat> seeing what people on Telegram write, and even in Russian in Russian segment, people are also concerned how how it is possible and where could he possibly have gone for the time. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. the big uh, question, I think. And uh, the next one, maybe we will be moving towards European side more. Uh, how do you, how would you um, maybe describe the cooperation between uh, American, European, and Ukrainian intelligence services? Well, it's been active. Uh, there's both cooperation and then there's what I call active operations uh, against each other. That um, you know, the United States uh, is spying on Ukraine at the same time that it's helping Ukraine. It's become clear uh, in the last couple of weeks that the Brits have played the large, a uh, very large role in uh, the Ukraine project. It's always sort of been a passion of theirs, but uh, apart from the money the United States is putting in, a lot of the training that has been carried out has been done by the Brits, not by the United States. So, you know, the United States hasn't been bringing Ukrainian soldiers to the U.S. for training. They've been going to Britain. And the the, the intelligence services, both uh, CIA and MI6, play a, a big role in interacting with the military in Ukraine uh, just because, you know, it has been vowed that the United States isn't going to put boots on the ground. Well, that means official military uh, but it doesn't, doesn't exclude putting in CIA personnel. So there was a there was an article over the you know, a few months back by Bill Arkin, writing in Newsweek, and when he laid out that that the CIA was really the the major point of coordination and contact with Ukrainian authorities, and and particularly on the military side. So uh, you know they're active. Yeah, that's uh, we can see. And people and I had heard rumors that uh, it was MI6 uh, who were actually behind the attacks on Belgorod. What do you think? Yes, yeah, very possible. You know, they're using uh, the passing at a minimum passing the intelligence uh, from the over the satellites with the coordinates and the imagery needed in order to program the cruise missiles or the, the particular missile systems used. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Mm, but I have maybe follow follow up questions for that Belgorod because that was really uh, like uh, it was a shocking event for Russian speaking for me people in Russia and that's why I'm asking because it's uh, it's a biased topic because you they say that uh, uh, Ukraine did everything right and Russia said called that attack a terror act. So how oh, well, can we... yes, it's, it's not hitting a military target. There is no military target there. It's not like there was a military headquarters <clears throat> or a warehouse or uh, even, you know, a significant air defense system. And yet this is, you know, this is typical of what the Ukrainians have been doing to civilians in Russian speaking areas, whether it's actually on Russian territory in Belgorod or in the cities of Luhansk and Donetsk, you know, over the last nine years. They're actually going on 10 years now. So for, for almost a decade, uh, they've just been routinely killing civilians, trying to cre create terror, to try 
The, the, the goal is cause enough civilian casualties that you will create outrage among the civilian population, and hopefully that outrage will be directed at uh, Vladimir Putin and will weaken political support for Putin. That's, that's the name of the game. And it is backfiring because instead of diminishing support for Putin, it's uh, enhancing support for Putin. Yeah, that's yeah, that sounds yeah reasonable, I'd say. And uh, well, if we are speaking uh, in, about Ukraine in general, uh, you know, uh, of course, ev everyone knows that uh, lots of like uh, arms are being pumped in the in the Ukraine, and they have and they have been selling those arms and those munitions they have, yeah. that have been supplied to the Ukraine. They are just spreading all over the world. So the first question is why there is not enough control of that? I st uh, because uh, it, these are si like serious things that are not some toys. And the second one, is it going to fire back, say, at Europe in at, at any case? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I guess I've been surprised. We've heard the reports that a lot of these weapons are making their way into the black market, but I'm not seeing actual evidence. You know. I would expect to see it, for example, in Gaza. Yeah, I would expect to see some javelins and anti-tank guided uh, missiles uh, being being used down there, and and that hasn't happened so far. In fact, the uh, the Hamas fighters appear to be using, you know, some fairly old weapon systems. So, uh, you know, they're having some effect, but uh, so yeah. I don't know where these I don't know where these weapons are, where they are being used, because the one areas of conflict that we see, we're not seeing the evidence of it there. But, the you know, clearly there are the reports of the corruption. The problem right now that the West has primarily is not so much that it's selling weapons that are getting you know, skimmed off into a black market. <laughs> it's just that the West can't manufacture the weapons the, the particularly the artillery rounds that the Ukrainians need. It, the United States, its industrial base has really been hollowed out. Uh, so uh, it, as a result, uh, the United States is not in a position to supply what Ukraine needs or claims that it needs in order to combat Russia. Yeah, that's a uh, that's really interesting topic because Europe also yeah, as of planning to in increase the production, mm. but I don't know at what uh, well on what basis they are going to do that because uh, all those uh, like petroleum prices went up, electricity prices went up, so this will be uh, like firing gold. I think will be cheaper than <laughs> well, production well. of the munition, so it is also a, a problem here. There was one, you know, one thing I, I put out an article last night about uh, Great Britain. So news, news has come out that the, the British, and this, and this is relevant to this question of Ukraine, uh, the British are advertising on social media, on LinkedIn, uh, for an admiral to be in charge of their submarine fleet, and which carries their nuclear weapons. Now, now think about that. They're advertising on social media. That you know, normally the way the military works is you are you getting promoted through you know through the ranks, and there are should be several vice admirals, several captains that have demonstrated a skill or expertise. And what they're saying, what the British demonstrated by this is. Uh, we don't have a single person that's currently in the military that we think is worthy and capable and competent to, to take this position. So let's advertise it on LinkedIn. I, I, the, the absurdity of this is remarkable. But then when you de dig deeper uh, into what's going on in the British military, in particular the Royal Navy, they've had to stop using two of their ships because they didn't have enough sailors to put on board to uh, to crew them so they've, they've shut down two of the ships um, they they had one of their aircraft carriers that tried to sell out to a exercise with the united states in august of uh, 2022 and uh, that aircraft carrier uh, broke down so they had to tow it back into harbor and then they didn't have the parts available to do an immediate or quick repair 
So after about six months, they started taking parts off of that aircraft carrier to put on board another ship to use. Uh, they were cannibalizing it. So he said, oh, well, that's just the Royal Navy. Well, then you find out who trained the Ukrainians, who was the principal lead trainer for getting the Ukrainians prepared for their counteroffensive, British military. That right there explains why the one of the reasons that the Ukrainians lost, uh, because the, the Brits have no competence in any of these areas anymore. Zero. And uh, they, they linger on with this delusion that there's still some global colonial power with the preeminent military. Uh, it, it's, it's just it's really it's remarkable. And, you know, when, when you realize that, that that's the people that the Ukrainians are taking advice from. No wonder the Ukrainians lost the counteroffensive. Yeah, I have read several articles by the Ukrainians who are complaining about NATO standards in general. And I'm not mistaken, it was Zaluzhny who said that we must go back to old Soviet uh, manuals instead of using NATO manuals. Sure, sure. Uh, what What's like surprising me is how uh, Great Britain, which, which was one of the biggest powers, military powers in the world, right. and how uh, in such a short term, term it turned into what it turned. That's what interests me now. Because well, it, destroy, it destroyed itself. Uh, one was the meaningless war of World War One, you know, suffering millions of casualties out of that, followed up by World War Two, where they lost an additional 370,000 men, 350,000 men, I believe, uh, and in the process were stripped of a lot of their colonial territories, or it showed a lot of their former, uh, what were then current colonies that they didn't, they no longer needed to be under the rule of the Brits. And so they sought their own independence and you had independence movements break out uh, throughout Asia, Africa, principally, uh, some in the Caribbean. So, but, you know, that uh, Britain demonstrated that, uh, you know, that kind of colonial power really can't sustain itself if it gets embroiled in military adventurism, which is what the United States is now learning the hard way. You know, the United States has become a de facto colonial power. And instead of building itself a good, strong foundation here in the United States, um, ensuring that the economy's strong, that there's good infrastructure, that people are properly educated, that there's uh, some good form of social control with law and order, the United States is busy spending trillions of dollars in other places, Iraq, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and uh, really weakening itself in the process. Yeah, that's that's sad because it would be nice to see a lot of strong countries which move together in one direction rather than what we see now. Right. I, yeah, I think the world would be more stable if it was like that. But uh, speaking about like uh, other countries, so we see the West has provided it best they could to the Ukraine, like in terms of military aid and in terms of training. So I think they did the best they could, but they did, still didn't help the Ukrainians to win and to advance in, uh, like make any s significant advances in what they did. But uh, here I have heard that Korea has uh, has supplied a lot of uh, munitions to the Ukraine. I mean, South Korea. And on the other hand, I heard that there are missiles from North Korea going to Russia. Right. How yeah, credible that information might might be? Yeah, I wrote I wrote about this the other day that uh, the the storyline, the narrative in the West is that Russia is weak militarily, and therefore, because it's so weak militarily and it's weak industrially, it needs to get uh, weapons, get missiles, rockets from North Korea and from and drones from Iran because. Russia just can't produce it. Well, that's a lie. <laughs> that's not what's going on. I, I think, but I did raise the possibility that it, it's very possible that Russia allowed North Korean missiles to be used on the battlefield in order for the to test them. You know, normally when North Korea is firing off a ballistic missile, 
it has to do so. It you know carves out a safe area in the ocean and fires it out into the ocean, and they watch it. But it's not being fired under combat conditions. It's not being fired at a very specific target that they can measure, you know, its accuracy. So they get to use it in combat now, in real combat, and against real targets. And you know, I I can see a one scenario in which. The Russians would say to the North Koreans, "Okay, sure, yeah, you know, bring your, bring your uh, rockets, your missiles. We'll uh, put them in place, you know, launch them. You can monitor what goes on. We'll see how they perform." You know, I think that's going on. Uh, so this this escalation that is taking place is certainly in favor of Russia. The the Ukrainians have few options, and, and no matter what South Korea sends, uh, the South Koreans didn't willingly part with their 155 millimeter artillery shells. They did so under pressure from the United States. And the reason the United States pressured them is because the United States no longer had any to send. So it's just, you know, again, it's it's just one other indicator of the slippage in U.S. influence and U.S. dominance within the world. Yeah, that's true. And another also question about India. There were reports of Indian shells which were as if sold to the Ukrainian side. And India said that, no, we didn't do that and we must investigate. How how could anything like that be possible? Um, I don't know. Uh, it, if the government is denying it, then you know the other possibility exists that somebody, you know, a rogue element decided to try to send some, but you know, they're not sending anything in any kind of quantities, and particularly if the government of India is not actively cooperating in doing that, then you know you're not going to get the volumes that would potentially make a difference. So you know I think it's just it's just one of those other stories that may may have in its foundation an effort to try to undermine BRICS try to sow dissension among uh, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And another question on India then, uh, there are also like rumors of a sort that India is uh, turning, uh, turning away from Russia and drifting more to the American side. How possible is that or is, is and what possible cooperation may India with uh, the US have? Yeah, that, I, I think that's uh, just what what you described it as a rumor. Uh, it's really part of, I think, more of a let's call it an information operation by the some on the intelligence community to try to sow division between Russia and uh, India, because you know India's had long-standing positive relations with Russia that stretch back, you know, 50, 60 years. Uh, I recall. Back in 1973, uh, my wife, she wasn't yet my wife, but she was attending college and they had what they called a winter term where the students went to uh, did certain projects. And she went to India for uh, four weeks and she stayed with the family of the prime minister, Bandura Shastri. Well, Bandura Shastri had died the previous year during a diplomatic trip. To, to Moscow when the Soviets were in power. So, you know, this long-standing relationship between India and the old Soviet Union and the current Russia, it's, it's, it's active and it's not going away. Because that tri uh, triangle in, uh, of, of the Eurasia, like China, India and Russia, it's yeah. like uh, on the <clears throat> On one hand, it's it, it's source of instability because of India-China relationships. On the other hand, there is right, right. Russia. So how that uh, configuration is going to work? Well, it's uh, like for for me, it's uh, a mystery because I read some comments like from Indians, and uh, I cannot read read Chinese comments, of course. But some Indians are well sticking to. Uh, uh, let's say, not very pro-China position, let's put it mildly. Well, yeah, yeah. No, there, there, there certainly is animus within the sectors of India towards China. Uh, India's biggest problem, while well, India's got a, its population continues to grow while India, while China's is uh, shrinking, uh, India still faces that great internal division between Hindus versus Muslims. 
And so the, that sectarian strife is still a major factor in India. Uh, China is not disrupted by that same kind of great, you know, ethnic strife or sectarian strife in its country. So China has an advantage on that side. But I, I think both have seen that there, there's, they have a stronger incentive right now to try to work together. I would not, though, dismiss the possibility of Western policy, both by the Brits and by the United States, of trying to create division and sow conflict. That's really been the pattern of the United States and a lot of its policy. That's why Nixon went to China in 1972 to get open to China so that we could use it as a wedge against the then Soviet Union. Uh, so this this uh, use of creating controversy and conflict has been sort of a cornerstone of Western foreign policy. Instead of really trying to build constructive relationships, we try to set countries up so they can they can fight so that, you know, can weaken them as well as uh, not provide uh, a solid partner for Russia or China in whatever particular area. We saw that in the Middle East during the 1980s when the United States was arming both, both Iran and Iraq, even though we considered Iran a terrorist nation. And why were we doing that? Well, we one, we wanted them both to bleed themselves out, kill as many of themselves as possible. And two, it was to prevent either of them from becoming any kind of reliable ally of uh, the Soviet Union. So that, that attitude persists. And I think that's, that's some of what you're seeing now with these reports about unrest in India or uh, the, the, the political conflict brewing. Mm -hmm. I see, because uh, many people wonder, and I wonder too, what could be a next like uh, conflict spot on this globe? And it's, well, it's Gaza, of course, and uh, it's obvious. But uh, what could be other other points? Like uh, some some speculate it might be in in Arctic. Some speculate it might be in Africa. So yeah, well, the the, the, the West is, the West is being driven out of Africa. So. Uh, you know, we saw that in Niger with the French being forced out. And and the United States is not in, in, in a strong position there either. Uh, you've got, you know, Taiwan frequently pops up as a, as a likely spot of conflict. Again, I don't think the Chinese government is going to take overt military action against Taiwan. Uh, we'll see what happens after the elections in a couple of weeks or I guess next week. Uh, so that that I think China's ultimate goal is to take back uh, full control of Taiwan in the same way they took control of uh, Hong Kong, do it through political means as opposed to military means. The uh, I, I think the war in Gaza we run a risk of that that expanding throughout the region because there's still several. Uh, the voices in the United States that agitate for an attack on Iran. They're very keen on destroying Iran. And, and I think, uh, you know, that that creates, it creates the possibility that this war, this war could really, it could ex expand and expand dramatically. Because there were also like um, thoughts about Armenia, who is being also as if, as if dragged into NATO, which is, right. uh, uh, sounds like uh, strange because uh, Armenia isn't in North Atlantic, but NATO isn't about North North Atlantic anymore too. So how uh, Armenia could be used against Iran? Is it a threat to Iran or? Yeah, the, uh, I, I don't think that will happen. Uh, yes, there there's certainly animus uh, among Armenians towards the Iranians, but. You know, I think that this what's happening in Ukraine is going to give a lot of these nations pause in getting and trusting the United States and trusting, you know, Britain to, to have their back. Yeah, we'll get you involved in a fight and we'll be with you there all the way. And then they they're seeing right now even Ukraine is involved with this life and death struggle and the West is not providing all the support that it promised. Not that that support would make any difference as far as the victory for Ukraine, but 
uh, it still would put Ukrainians in a stronger negotiating position potentially, but you know that's not happening. So um, what is clear is that the United States has not been a force for peace. It has not been a source to try to quiet conflicts. It's actually, you know, tried to exacerbate them. That's that's why, you know, the United States and Great Britain um, went into uh, Syria and tried to over... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, why they went into Syria, tried to destroy the government of Bashar al-Assad and are still there carrying out military operations, ostensibly to against ISIS. But, uh, there, you know, there's been some evidence that at least with some of the radical Islamic groups that the United States has been funding and arming them. So, yeah, it is like it is because uh, what I see here with all those <coughs> conflicts going on, the more nations are being deprived of peace, the more terrorism risk it creates. Right, right. And right. here it is a question about West security of you EU European Union and about yes how uh, how do you see the possibilities of those nations to protect their citizens because there were reports of uh, increased terrorist attack risk uh, in in Europe and during new year's holidays so that's um, that's but dangerous did, did they did they happen they didn't happen but there were reports of supposedly yeah. high high risk well, and that's why I always put a, the, I ask the question, did it happen? Because a lot of these, you know, reports that are leaked out are actually designed to manipulate public opinion. They're, they're, they're really, I'll call them intelligence disinformation campaigns designed to provoke, a, elicit a particular response among people as opposed to actually warn of a real threat. So, but... Uh, <clears throat> How do you uh, uh, estimate that risk of increase in t terrorist attacks in general? Is it possible or? No, I, I, I don't think. Uh, only if the West decides to engage in terrorism. Uh, you know, the, the recent attack in Iran that killed uh, close to 200 people with the bombing at the uh, commemoration of the funeral of uh, Soleimani. Who, who, who was behind that? Well, there were the two likely candidates. The one that took credit was ISIS. Uh, why does ISIS uh, want to hurt Iran? Well, Iran is close with uh, Syria. ISIS is fighting Syria. Who else is fighting Syria? The United States and Great Britain. So you have a, a convergence of uh, policy between the United States and a terrorist group, ISIS. The United States also has been actively supporting a group, the Mujahideen al Khalq, uh, the MEK, uh, who has been engaged with terrorist attacks throughout uh, Iran. And uh, the, it, it was on the US list of terrorist groups until 2012, I believe, when Barack Obama's government removed it. Why? Because we wanted to then start providing support to a terrorist group in order to try to weaken Iran. So um, terrorism does not be, it's not able to be a force around the world without the support of a state. And this is why during the Cold War, both the United States and, and the Soviets were guilty of providing support to groups that carried out terrorist attacks. Uh, and then the growth and expansion of ISIS, that was enabled in part by support from Gulf Arabs. So, you know, it, it, until a country decides it's going to start investing in that, then, you know, we're not going to, terrorism is just, a, I describe it as a tool used to control populations and publics and governments. Uh, the fear factor. If I can make you afraid that we've got to stop this terrorist, then you'll gladly surrender your civil rights. You'll allow the government to spy on you. Yes, because it's, it feels like uh, they are providing safety. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because, well, okay, they can monitor my my phone, they can mo monitor my email to make sure that I'm not under risk. That's, yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah, 
And in general, what do you think about Iran? Is it possible that you, that the U.S. could try maybe attack Iran like uh, in an uh, open way? It, 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 if the United States does that, it would be a terrible mistake. Uh, there are people that believe, you know, in this, in the, in my country, in the United States, that we can easily bomb Iran and that well, that will solve the problem. They'll send the the mullahs fleeing in terror, and the Iranian people will rise up and overthrow this Islamic regime, and you know, the United States will be back in control of Iran. It's not happening. Uh, if the United States tries uh, launches military attacks against Iran. Iran is in a position to defend itself, number one, and to retaliate in ways that would be very detrimental to U.S. interests, particularly with respect to Israel. So, uh, but I can't rule out that that's not going to happen as far as uh, the U.S., that the U.S. will decide not to attack Iran. There's a lot of pressure for that. We'll, we'll see what happens. It's it's a very dangerous time in the world. Yeah, and that region in general also, like in in particular too, because there were reports of some pirate attacks on ships. Is it like, uh, do you think it is like planned from like a, a false flag operation, or it is like uh, carried out by the by the local forces? Yeah, well, no, we could see we could see a what I call a Gulf of Tonkin incidents, a staged attack in the Red Sea on U.S. naval vessels that would be blamed on Iran in order to justify a military strike on Iran. I see I see that as a very uh, possible scenario. But uh, the what's going on with respect to the Houthis shutting down the Red Sea, that's really created a big, big problem, big dilemma for the West. The, the United States is the actually the only country with any kind of credible naval force that could go into that sea. But when they do so, they're really putting themselves at risk. And they don't want to run the risk of getting their ships attacked and sunk. The British are, are irrelevant. They're, they're like a yappy little dog. Uh, they, think they're, you know, they think they're a Rottweiler and they're barely a Chihuahua. Uh, I, I think of them more as a Shih Tzu. Um, because uh, they don't have, they're not able to sustain a naval force at sea. And the United States is barely able to s sustain one. We don't have really a good, good capability to resupply for extended period. That's why the uh, U.S. aircraft carrier that was uh, Gerald Ford, I believe it was, was just called back to port because, uh, you know, they have to go back and refit. Plus, they were also undermanned. So a lot of problems on this, but... That doesn't all those problems doesn't make somebody step back and say, maybe we ought to keep our powder dry and not run the risk of uh, provoking a conflict with Iran. Maybe just the opposite. Yes, I think everything is possible now because we are in such circumstances when it's very hard to prognose anything. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, and and I had suddenly question I didn't plan it about Turkey. What do you think about Turkey? Because uh, last week there were reports that that they didn't uh, allow British uh, ships to to enter the um, Black Sea. Yeah. Refer to Montreux that uh, uh, act or I forgot. Yeah. That. Sorry. No, no, yeah, that uh, Turkey. Turkey That's definitely is uh, carving out its uh, you know own path. Um, you you have to separate the, the the rhetoric of Erdogan from the actual actions. Now, refusing to allow the Brits into the Black Sea was, I think, uh, Turkey sending a very clear message. They don't want to have anybody do anything that's going to escalate the risk of war with Russia. Because if the British ship goes into the Black Sea, they'll be a potential target for Russia. And Russia is not going to stand by and let uh, Western naval forces come and create a potential threat to it. Uh, that said, while Erdogan's rhetoric against Israel in particular has been very heated, uh, tr calling them Nazis and likening them to the Nazis and the Holocaust, uh, he still allowed oil to go to Israel. So until the moment comes that he cuts off the oil, uh, his you know, protestations, I think, ring a little hollow. But, you know, Turkey status, I, they, I think they've, they've changed. They wanted to be part of the European Union. I think that those days are over. 
yeah, they're still the the application is still active, but um, they, they're focused more on their national identity and realize that they don't need to be uh, the a poodle on the leash as far as the EU is concerned. You know, they they started that accession process 20 years ago. And they're still they're no closer to joining the EU now than they were 20 years ago. They, I think they understand <clears throat> understand they recognize. <clears throat> Excuse me. They represent the second largest army in NATO, and are, are critical in that factor. And I think that they, you know, they're not going to be used uh, to satisfy European interests that don't necessarily coincide with Turkish interests. Yeah, and in general, <clears throat> speaking, speaking about NATO armies, uh, how do you evaluate maybe what can be called the first best and second best? Who would be those forces uh, which are well, very the first, capable? The first is the United States, uh, and then the second would be Turkey. Uh, the Before the special military operations started, actually the second, probably second best military in NATO was Ukraine. Even though Ukraine was not part of NATO, it had become a de facto member. So... Hey, Elena, I just uh, got to give you the five minute warning because I have another commitment. Ah, OK, 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 then we'll <clears throat> finish soon. So, yes, uh, I, I, I share I have also I had also same same opinion and I was glad I was right about that. Yes, because no. many people are now making fun of the Ukraine as if they are weak, but uh, I never said I never thought that it, that they are weak. They right, are no. a real like force. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah, then, okay, I, I will let you go now. All thank right, well, thank you. Thank you so much, and sorry for the confusion. Yeah, uh, excuse me, too. I, I have to be more, more clear next time. All right, take care, Lena. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.